Okay, hello and welcome to the msdynamicsworld.com Fall 2013 uh, CRM webcast series. I am Jason Gumpert and joining us today are Dan Griffin, Channel Sales Director and Tara Hirschand, uh Relationship Manager at CoreMotive, the silver pop, com uh, silver pop company. And they will be talking to us today about using dynamic CRM to plan and justify 2014 marketing campaigns. As we get started, I just want to add that we invite you to add your feedback and ask questions today during Tara and Dan's presentation. You can uh, add your questions and comments through the Q&A block or the chat block that you will see on the right side of the webcast panel. And our speakers will definitely leave some time at the end to answer questions. So without further delay, uh, please allow me to welcome uh, Tara Hirschen to start things off. All right, great, thanks. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. So, um, as he mentioned, I'm a relationship manager for Core Motives. Um, there's a lot that goes under that umbrella of my responsibilities. Um, one of the things I really enjoy is working with customers and helping them get the most out of Core Motives and make sure that they're using it to its full potential and that um, you know we're leveraging CRM and marketing together and really have the whole marketing automation story together and just to help them along with their efforts. Um, it's I work with a bunch of different sizes of companies, um, all in different industries, and just helping them achieve, achieve that end goal and um, you know make sure that the opens and the clicks and what we'll get into later, all the information that you have in CRM that you can leverage and use with Core Motives. So um, I have a lot of experience again working with the different customers and you know pulling. Um, pulling ideas from a lot of different areas, and I'm happy to share some of those and what I've gathered along the years with you here today. Um, I'm also joined by Dan Griffin, and he will tell you a little bit about his experience and background with this. So Dan, do you want to introduce yourself here? Sure. Thank you, Tara. Uh, my name is Dan Griffin. I'm Channel Sales Director for Silverpop, and what I focus on is building awareness in the Microsoft community around the Core Motives product and then also an additional product that integrates with Microsoft CRM called Engage. Our, my primary focus is really the education around marketing automation to both the CRM customer community and the Microsoft CRM partner community. I, previous to joining uh, Core Motives and Silverpop, I spent several years in the Microsoft CRM consulting space, leading a large uh, enterprise class professional services group really focused on building that roadmap which included marketing automation and how those clients such as yourselves could leverage marketing automation in that broad 360 degree customer view. So um, what we'd like to do is, is really jump in. We're going to start from ingredients for marketing success. We're going to drive through a little bit of basic understanding of marketing automation, the ROI model, important steps within the ROI model. I'm going to hand the ball to Tara. Tara is going to talk specifically about ROI metrics. And then we're going to pull back out and uh, really summarize what we visited today and, and open it up for questions. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started in some of the detail. So first and foremost, Tara, if you don't mind going back, um, we're going to talk real quick about the ingredients to marketing success. And from Silverpop perspective, we see this as three key criteria. There is, from a marketer's perspective, the vision. What are we trying to accomplish? And this is really at a macro level, not just with the individual campaign or customer interaction, but how are we driving success? What do we expect? The, the old ad, adage of inspect what you expect, that makes a lot of sense when you're planning your marketing efforts. Leveraging Microsoft Dynamics CRM and core motives together as a solution allows you to, to take your vision and turn it into real action. There are two subsequent boxes, data and skills, that are also part of the marketing success criteria. So you can sit and you can certainly work through the strategy, but unless you have trusted data and unless you have the skills, you're not going to be able to execute on your vision. So we'll talk a little bit about data later to, uh, later within this presentation, and Tara will take you through some of the skills. And keep in mind that as we funnel into Tara's, present, Tara's portion of the presentation, we'll actually get into some examples within Microsoft Dynamics CRM with the Core Motives Meta, product completely embedded within that application. So as we look at, you know, the first thing we want to talk about is 
what is a campaign? So there are a couple different definitions, whether you happen to be an IT person within the organization, a marketer, or a professional services uh, delivery person from the partner community. So as we talk about campaigns in the pure Microsoft Dynamics uh, CRM context, they are really containers for managing your campaign from start to finish. Um, if you're familiar with the campaign functionality, which in my experience of, of eight years within Microsoft Dynamics CRM and 13 years within CRM products in general, the marketing functionality is likely the least utilized of all of the capabilities that are, are brought within all enterprise class CRM solutions. But from a campaign perspective, we're really focused on a few things. The planning task. So what do we need to do to take a, the vision and execute on my campaign? The activities of a campaign, so those outreach touches or feeling mechanisms or listening mechanisms that allow you to interact with your prospects or customers. And then, of course, that upper level data around a campaign, driving the ROI. Uh, increasingly important in today's environment is the ability to take marketing dollars, and apply a return on investment to either make sound decisions on should we continue to execute a campaign or a strategy, and also to justify your budget. I'm sure for those marketers on our call today, you're going through the budgeting process if you're within your fiscal year coming to an end for what you're going to do next year. And it'd be really helpful to be able to take this R these ROI metrics to justify why and where you're going to spend your marketing dollars. And then, of course, when we get into the core motives or the marketing automation functionality, we want to talk about those post-planning and, and the post-launch events. So the ability to, to really take that financial in information, to really start to grab ROI from the lead perspective through to an, a sales opportunity. And not to be lost on our marketing efforts are continuing education of our clients, visits to blogs, and those social interactions that are becoming more important as, as our customers and prospects are able to go out and be more educated in today's world. Campaigns specifically, so the individual campaign itself, really starts to break down into a few basic elements as you're delivering those pieces. So Tara, if you don't mind going to the next slide. As we talk about campaigns, if you're familiar with the campaign functionality in CRM, um, you do have the, the general information around what are we trying to accomplish with the campaign, um, the description, the runtime, uh, the, also the ROI model or, or the potential payback, and, and several other pieces that we just previously spoke about. But some of the details or execution within a campaign, especially when you leverage a core motives product uh, from a marketing automation perspective, get into marketing list management data, extremely important in this scenario. Emails. So you can see on the slide we have a few different ideas of what these email interactions might look like. So it could be a save the date for a conference or a webinar, much like the one that you're participating in today, all the way down to auto response to different interactions that occur, pre-event reminders, post-event recap, a way to go out and touch your, your customers and prospects and, and keep them up to date, informed, and interacting with you. And then, of course, there's the next level of interaction, which includes things like landing pages, RSVP forms, which come under the context of a web form. So my ability to direct a customer or a prospect to a web page or a landing page. And then, of course, leverage a form to capture that information or data about the person that you're interacting with or even update some potential information. And then, of course, one well, that's becoming more important Again, in our world where customers and prospects are continually more informed, the ability to survey your customers and prospects, find out what's important to them, or any other example within your line of business. But it's incredibly critical to talk to your customers on a continual basis, and leveraging these different campaign activities from a marketing automation perspective is really important. So let's talk a little bit about what marketing automation is for those that might not be very clear on uh, marketing automation, or maybe you're just a little confused as to uh, the different pieces of marketing automation that we just touched on. So just make this very simple. 
we've gone ahead and we've broken this down into six uh, legitimate marketing automation topics. We've talked about email. We've talked about web forms. Click tracking. So another piece of marketing automation that's really important is behavior and that individual behavior that your prospect or customer is displaying while you're not directly communicating with them. So web intelligence becomes important when if a prospect or a client visits your website, for example, Core Motives allows you to listen to those interactions and push that information integrated back into your CRM system. We're not going to explicitly focus on the web intelligence today because we really want to focus on the ROI that comes out of a campaign. But just imagine the power to, of knowing as a salesperson our our marketing counterparts, that full business development cycle, where someone visited if they're doing product research before a salesperson chooses to interact them in any particular way, whether it be an email, a phone call, an SMS message, and so on. And then, of course, lead scoring. Sales folks want to spend time working with prospects that have a better rate of closure. Lead scoring allows you, from a marketing automation perspective, to assign values to different actions, providing your sales team with a better vision as to who or what they're going to be interacting with in the near future. Um, surveys we spoke about previously and landing pages we spoke about previously. But it is incredibly important, again, to leverage all of these pieces that you have at your disposal just like you're focused on leveraging the different aspects of the social environment and the different opportunity that you have from an engagement perspective, just like as you're working at the, the micro level within an email send around the individual devices that you're going to be sending to. So leveraging the marketing automation package and all of those pieces within that package is very important. So as you develop your marketing automation strategy, you're certainly going to want to understand the end in mind, and that becomes ROI. How do I justify what I've just spent? It could be a week, several months, an entire year from a campaign or a strategy or a vision perspective. How do I produce an ROI that allows me contextual information about what worked and where we drove revenue from? So as we work from left to right around the funnel, you can see that campaigns, marketing lists, and mailings, those interactions or emails with your product are the first pieces. That's the front line within your marketing campaign. So to briefly walk through these steps, we've talked about the campaign and the activities associated with the campaign. You're going to build a marketing list, the data element, trusted data, making sure you're targeting the folks or the prospects or customers that need to be targeted within your campaign and really behavioral marketing at its finest. And then executing off those mailing lists or lists, the specific mailings to those folks. So again, that's the front end interaction. So the next step is how do I start to really understand the success of my interactions with my prospects or customers? So in Microsoft Dynamics CRM, the main way that this starts to work is through campaign responses. I suspect those folks that are using camp, uh, marketing or Microsoft Dynamics CRM have at least looked at the campaign response piece, but that's an integrated way to know that someone has interacted with a mailing that you have sent them. Campaign responses can automatically or manually be converted to leads. Imagine converting that campaign response to a lead and supplying a contextual score to your sales team or your qualification team so they're one step ahead of the game. And then, of course, we're all driving towards you know, moving down the funnel and providing our sales team with very specific opportunities for closure. And it's, this is a closed-loop cycle. So as the opportunity works its way through the opportunity cycle or the sales stage environment, as we push very hard to get to a win stage and even a loss stage, which you do want to measure, you can then understand the revenue driven by an opportunity over a time frame and associate that back to the campaign. With Core Motives and Microsoft Dynamics CRM, this is an integrated, seamless process. You choose as a marketer, business development person, salesperson, operations person, how CRM works for you, and Core Motives will support that process or that vision through your execution. 
Sarah, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the first step in the real execution is cleansing your database. So like we talked about in the outset, your vision can be outstanding. Your strategy can be foolproof. You can have tactical steps within your campaign. And we've all, I'm assuming, had the same issue where we're not necessarily trusting our database. If you've gone through a CRM implementation in the past, you know that CRM adoption is key. Things need to be easy, and your data needs to be trusted by all individuals interacting with the data. It's really important to understand sending an email is, is relatively cheap, but it's not free. And, and why do we point this out? Because data that is sent, uh, an email that is sent to a, a, con a customer or a prospect that does not reach that prospect is a wasted send. So we want to make sure that we are doing things to help protect ourselves and target market and not grab an entire marketing list of, of all contacts or all leads within your database and sending those out. Again, this is a basic marketing practice, but we just want to point out that it's important to cleanse your database. So be smart on who you're sending your emails to. Admit that you have dirty data. Admit that you need to spend time with your data and with your marketing list prior to a send. Of course, Microsoft Dynamics offers you a couple different options. You have a static marketing list and a dynamic marketing list. The nice thing about both of these lists is that you can leverage the attributes or the, the data elements within CRM to properly include or exclude the right segment of prospects and customers for your marketing list. Remove those inactive contacts or leads. It doesn't make much sense if someone or a automated rule within your organization has, has taken the time to put that customer or prospect or lead into an inactive status to send to them. They've been put there for a reason. Take the time to set your lists up appropriately. So on that, let's talk about a couple ways that you can clean up your data. And then once we get through that piece, I'm going to turn it over to Tara. So part of my experience within the CRM community, leveraging marketing automation functions and working with salespeople through an opportunity cycle is the trusted data uh, box that we talked about that was right in the middle of the vision box and skills step to successful marketing. We talked a lot, we spent a good bit of time already talking about the email address, the, you know, even the physical address, making sure that your data is clean. But you also want to track your, your prospects, customers, and leads who have email by the source. You want to segment those by source, so leverage the marketing list. Identify poor sources. Exclude those. Consider exploring other options. Always focus on your data to ensure that you have a crisp and clean set of data elements to go ahead and market to those folks. The best part about Microsoft Dynamics CRM when it comes to interactive contacts or prospects or leads is that when you set them to an inactive status, you can always bring them back to an active status. I had very rarely ever recommended to a client of mine to delete contacts or to delete records in general from their CRM system unless they are transactional in nature and provide little to no value to the end user. So make sure that you're setting things to an inactive status rather than deleting them because you never know when that inactive prospect or lead that hadn't responded comes back into your fold. Again, data is important. Take the time to leverage outside sources. There are several uh, ISVs within the Microsoft Dynamics community similar to Silverpop Core Motive that can help you with your data cleansing exercise. And again, I would recommend that you look, to, look through that process and, and always work with your technology department to ensure that, that you are doing the best and the, the correct effort to keep your data clean. Can you go to the next slide, Tara, please? Thank you. So the, the kind of the last piece within the ways to clean up information is eliminating addresses that have never been active. It's okay to eliminate those folks that you get a return to sender or a hard bounce from because you know you're never going to reach them. So when we talked about eliminating inactives, make sure that 
if you get a hard bounce, you definitely do not want to uh, send market to those folks anymore. Um, identifying, again, your sources of your list. Make sure that for poor performing for sources, which with a correct strategy through the ROI model over time, you'll be able to understand if those sources that you're buying your, your lists from or renting your lists from are actually able to uh, fulfill what you're expecting them to provide you. Implement a win-back campaign for inactive addresses. Marketing automation at its finest. The ability to build a strategy that does not involve further human interaction to nurture those inactive addresses back into an active state. Your definition of active is your definition of active, but to get them back into the loop and interacting with you, whether it be direct to your website or any other uh, way that you might be able to track that you're interacting with those prospects or customers. For me, one of the most important pieces of marketing automation and developing an ROI is really taking a measure as you trap or catch people, those prospects or customers, as they're going through the buying cycle and the research cycle. Before they go to an inactive status, understand the different segments and the different behaviors that are going on and take appropriate action. This is going to be helpful to the nurture process and within a marketing automation platform integrated with Microsoft Dynamics CRM, you'll be able to treat customers or prospects within their segment or determining criteria the way that you need them to be treated. And we talked about the use of third-party tools. Um, there, are, there are several tools that you can use. We won't go into detail of which tools make the most sense, but when, most of those third parties are willing to take a subset of your data, cleanse it for you, or do an analysis and give you an idea of how clean your data is and where you have areas for improvement. We certainly recommend that you take this into consideration um, at any point in the life cycle of your CRM program because the data is always going to be very, very important. Um, certainly within uh, any of the community members, you'll be able to find those third-party tools. So again, before I turn it over to Tara, the vision is incredibly important. Data. Data is king when it comes to the marketer's life cycle within a marketing automation platform. And of course, having the necessary skills within your group to be able to execute on your vision with trusted data is the next step. So with that, I'm going to ask Tara to uh, spend some time talking about metrics and share with you a few different ROI models and, um, within those metrics that you can look at from a marketer's perspective. Great, thanks, Dan. All right, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about understanding your metrics. So you send out your emails, um, you get all of this information back, and what should you do with it, and how can you understand and make sure that you are um, using all this information that you're gathering wisely. So, um, you know, people will come in and they might be talking about open rates, and you have an open rate, and you had you know, maybe 30% open and you know, you're going to rate that as a success. Well, sometimes you need to look in, further to look in further into that and maybe an open isn't really your end goal. One of the great things about core motives and being completely embedded within Microsoft Dynamics CRM, you can have all this information pulled directly under the contact record. So instead of just looking at that open or maybe the click and calling that a success, you can see a lot more into how this person is interacting with you and really judge off of that and be able to create marketing lists going forward, be able to create triggered emails, um, you maybe have some workflows set up that really tell you more and are, speak more specifically to that individual. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody, you want, it's kind of the golden rule, you know, treat, treat others as you want to be treated. I'm going to not be happy with something if, you know, they're sending me sales on, you know, men's shoes. I'm going to be shopping for women's shoes or maybe women's clothing. If they are telling you this information about your, themselves, then you should honor that and you should speak to them relevantly. Um, so just having an open for an email or just having, you know, a click is not something that's understanding all of your metrics. 
um, and kind of pulling it back into Microsoft Dynamics CRM and Core Motive, you can see the full story. So you can see how, if they're opening, if they're clicking, what they're clicking on, where they're going to on your website after that, um, if they've filled out any web forms, they've downloaded white papers, or maybe they've downloaded a brochure, you can see all that. So just a little bit about your metrics. The open rate should really kind of be call, um, called like a graphics rendering rate because an open is recorded whenever the receiving machine calls for that graphic from the sender. Um, so that's why this is kind of a more accurate term for this. Um, you know, with a lot of the times now the images are turned off by default, so a lot of em um, emails can be open without actually um, being registered as an open. Um, so of course, it, you know, it's not, they're not unimportant, but they just need to be understood as, as a measure and not an exact this, this is an interest. It could just be an open. And but then again, you know, maybe they didn't even open it. At, it didn't register as an open at all, but they did click on something. So that's why we also offer something called an implied open. So um, some of the things I just want to be clear on and kind of walk through. I know that not everybody loves definitions, but I think it's just great to get a good understanding of what all of this means and how it relates to you and how you can leverage, leverage this information you're gathering. So let's talk a little bit about um, the metrics that we should be using instead. So one of them is going to be email conversions. So how many or what percentage of the people took a direct desired action as a result of an email campaign? So this is kind of getting into a bit deeper into that on those clicks and where are they going after they open the email? What pages are they, are they looking at? Have they looked at this page before? Have they opened an email about this topic before or about this product? Um, you, can really, you can really look in and see how, what their conversion rate is and how, they are, how they're giving you more information about what they're doing and all of their clicks through. They're telling you things about themselves and it's your job to capture that information and use it um, to your advantage and to their advantage as well. I'm going to be much happier whenever I open an email that's relevant to me and I'm going to think, okay, these people really know me. You know, they're, they're, wanting, they're helping me through this buying process. They are, um, you know, suggestive selling to me. That, that makes me happy. Um, you know, and of course there's always that, that kind of thin line of being too helpful and being a little creepy. So you always want to make sure, you know, that you're, you're not picking up the phone five seconds after they are on the web page and like, yes, we just saw that you looked at this, this, and this page, or you clicked on this, this, and this. So, you know, you want to do it gently. You want to do it um, kind of as you, as you would talk to somebody face-to-face. -face. If I walk into a store and somebody sees me shopping around, let's use the shoe example again, you know, sees me shopping around in the women's shoe section, they're not going to come up and say, hey, by the way, I know that you need a new pair of men's shoes. Here's a sale on this. So you want to talk to somebody um, over email and over um, interactions with them, phone calls, just as you would talk to them face to face. So, you know, they're giving you, you're not going to have the body language, you're not going to have those clues, but you'll have other clues about how they are interacting with your store or with your site, and you want to speak relevantly to that. So that's a little bit about the conversions. Um, we also have the email revenue. So this, you know, would be the amount of revenue generated as a result of the campaign. So this really gets into that ROI tracking, and this is where those campaigns can really be utilized. So you might have um, a, a handful of different analytics that all come into one campaign, and you can track that revenue on a campaign basis. So you can group those all into one bucket, one campaign, and have that together and be able to look at it as um, – as an aggregate level versus having to look into every single mailing or look into every single section to see how these are performing. The, the revenue can be bucketed with those campaigns and you can have a campaign ROI associated with that then. We also have our email gross profit. So this is the amount of revenue generated as a result of a campaign minus your direct costs, such as the cost of deployment, creative development, list rental, any of that in our unsubscribes and customer service. So this is just kind of a, an analytic you can pull together and kind of get a good picture. This is something that um, probably, you know, a lot of your C-level um, people are going to be involved in, want to know the exact numbers. Um, you know, I know our finance team, you, you're looking at it and they, they say, give me numbers, give me gross profit, give me, I want raw data, I want all this information here. 
and they are going to look at it differently than maybe your marketing team would. So you want to make sure that you're you are leveraging this information that you're gathering and um, can use it you know, across multiple ways. We also have our total click-throughs. So this is um, a number or a percentage of links that were clicked on in a campaign. Um, and it can be you know, just one link or multiple links um, within the same message. I really prefer to get down and get into the percentages of things. Um, you know, a number can be very relative. It's, you know, depending on how big of, of a list that was or how big of a um, send that was, you wouldn't necessarily know on a number wise. You would want to know more on a percentage wise. And the percentage is good, um, especially as we start to transform into bulk emails all the time and always sending the same message to everybody. We really want to transform into sending personalized emails, one on one emails. So we want an email that maybe we have a bulk send that's going out, but it's going out to 200,000 people. But our goal is we want that email to look different for each individual that receives that. So maybe that's with dynamic content, maybe that's with you know, um, some merge fields, you're using first name, you're pulling in interest. Um, maybe you know, if they have a, we have a lot of professional sports teams um, on board with us, maybe if they have a favorite player, we want to um, craft that happy birthday email to come from their favorite player and maybe have a, a picture of their favorite player on there. Um, really sending, and this can be done with those bulk emails. You can send it all to everybody at once if you would like. Um, on a birthday one, you'd obviously, you know, set it up and have a nurture campaign to run um, whenever the birth date is. But you can send out these emails, and it can be one kind of one effort, but just by utilizing some smart features, again, like dynamic content or merge fields, you can make that an individualized, customized email so each person feels as if they're getting this own, their own email that was tailored just for them. This can really help on those email click-through rates. Um, if somebody feels like they're interested and they feel like they're being listened to, and this email that you sent them interests them, they're probably going to click through on it. So that's something that you can really help um, whenever you're trying to look in and see how you're going to separate things out you can really look and say, okay, what is going to interest this person? What is going to make them click? Again, you know, our open is not always kind of the end all be all. You want somebody to click through. You want somebody to, to interact with your mailing. You don't want them to just look at it. So then this goes into your click to open rate. And, you know, opens are important, but the click to open can give you an insight into the effective, effectiveness or maybe the lack of effectiveness um, for the offer, the copy, um, or the links that are, are within this mailing. So this is, you know, the, the number of unique clicks compared to the number of unique opens, um, and it can be expressed as, as a percentage. Again, I'm kind of, I, I, I prefer the percentages so I can see maybe I have four or five emails that are going out, and, you know, three of them are to a smaller list, but it's highly targeted versus my, you know, bigger emails going out to, um, more people, still wanting it to be kind of the one-on-one -on -one messaging feel, but it could be a bulk send. And then we have our total email click-through. So this is the number of percentage of links that were clicked on into a campaign, and you, they can be clicked on multiple links or in the same message as well. And I just want to make sure that we, um, we have our mailings that are going out, but then we also have campaigns that are associated with that mailing. So just so, um, I know it can get a little confusing sometimes. Um, some people refer to the actual email that is going out as a campaign versus a mailing, um, just in kind of the core motors world and, and getting um, your, your email marketing into CRM, you would um, use the campaigns as kind of those buckets and what Dan was speaking about earlier. That's kind of a place to hold all of that information together for a campaign or for an effort. And within that campaign, it could be multiple mailings. Maybe you have, um, if you know, this is something about an event, we have a save the date, we have an invitation email, we have an autoresponder for that email, um, we might have a web form associated with it. So we're going to give them, an, we have an action that sends them an autoresponder for that RSVP. Then we have an, a pre-event email that goes out a day or two before the event. And then, you know, maybe we have a, a day of event um, mailing going out and then a post-event recap that, you know, might include a survey or something of that sort. So you can look at the total email click-throughs on an individual mailing level and then also in a campaign level. So all of those groups together would be that campaign. 
And then we also have our unsubscribe request. So this is something you always want to pay attention to as well. If somebody is unsubscribing, they are saying, I'm no longer interested in this. Please you know, don't send me this type of mailing. So and this can be a number of percentage of the people that unsubscribed um, after a particular mailing. And if you can notice that if this number is, is getting bigger, then you're probably doing something wrong. You are not sending targeted messages to these individuals, and they, they're, not, they're not satisfied with the content you're delivering to them. So you really want to take a look into that. Um, a little bit of what you can do with these unsubscribes is instead of just having an all on or an all off, so send me everything or send me nothing, you can have subscriptions and subscription centers. So just to talk a little bit about those, a subscription can be maybe you have newsletters that go out um, on a monthly basis, then you have webinars that you maybe do once a week like we're, like we're doing here, and then we have maybe you know, product update emails. So those are just I'm kind of three generic types of emails that um, a company may be sending. So you can give them options to say, okay, I still want to receive your monthly newsletter, and yes, I'm still interested in receiving um, all those product updates, but maybe I'm not so interested in receiving the weekly webinars anymore. Maybe I'll go to the website and check, check out what webinars are coming. Um, that allows them to say, okay, yes, send me these two things, but I'm no longer interested in the webinars. Don't send me that anymore. So now instead of them having to receive every mailing that goes out about the newsletters, every mailing that goes out about webinars, and every mailing that goes out about product updates, and receive all of them or none of them, they can really pick and choose. So that's another way that you can make sure that you're sending them targeted messaging. And then we also have the email abuse complaints. So, you know, this is something that that you we don't like to see and I whenever anything comes up um, you know, working with my customers, it's always something that I'm like, okay, this is kind of the you know, let's let's step back, take a look at what we're doing and reevaluate the situation here because if somebody is marketing you as spam, then you know that's something that you're getting complaints. So you you've really kind of upset them. They don't want to receive that anymore. That's again why the subscriptions and subscription center letting them tell you what they want to receive and you being able to honor that is very important. Within core motives, if somebody um, unsubscribes from a particular subscription, then it will map back to that contact or lead record and have a contact opt-in or opt-out. Um, then we also have the global opt-out. So let's say if somebody had like one of these spam complaints, we could globally opt them out so that they would not receive any emails from you again um, through, through core motives. They could still receive those kind of one-off emails if you, you know, a salesperson is talking to them or something and sending messages back and forth. But as far as a bulk then um, we would switch their record to do not allow bulk email. And so that even if they somehow made it on a list somewhere, um, we would pull that out and not send to them. So this is, this is just good to be able to honor their requests. And um, obviously, you know, keeping this metric as low as possible is definitely crucial to the, your, the health of an email program. So again, if this is something that you're having issues with, it's something you kind of want to step back and maybe um, you know, re, rethink what you're doing, rethink what you're sending, and make sure you, you have a good grasp on that. Okay, so now I'm going to go in real quick, and I want to show you a little bit of how these come into Core Motives. Let me share my desktop. And come into here, so hopefully. All right, looks like you can see that. Okay, so um, we are in Core Motives here, and this is, we are also in CRM. It's all built in one. If you haven't seen Core Motives before, here's your kind of first glance. Um, but so Core Motives lives within your marketing tab of CRM. I'm going to dive right in and kind of talk to you here about this email marketing section. And let me just tell you, there's a lot to Core Motives. You can see we have the web intelligence, the web content, we have social media, um, the email marketing section, and the usage summary. But um, for today, I definitely want to keep on our track of talking about mailings and talking about opens and clicks and um, your ROI associated with this. Um, if you're interested in learning more about some of these other features, feel free to reach out to us and we will be happy to show you those and go through a demo with you on here. Um, so going into a mailing, you can see I have in my status sheet then I have it um, selected so it'll show me all my sent mailings. You can see I have my recipients, my bounces, my opens, 
my implied open, so that's what I mentioned earlier, with maybe they clicked on a link, but they didn't actually show the images, so it didn't register as an open. You can have the implied open here. We have our clicks, any unsubscribes, and our spam count here. So I have opened up one of these, so let me click into here, and I can show you a little bit more about this. And so we, here's a mailing that's gone out. You can just see here's kind of the HTML content of this mailing. I'm going to jump down into the statistics. And now you can see my unopens, my bounces, and my opens. So you can see it um, numbers-wise or as a percentage here. And then this is that same information just without your bounces. And then if I scroll down a little bit, you can see my unsubscribes here. So you can see numbers-wise and then also as a percentage. I can really dig deep into this and look into my interactions. So here you can see all my opens. I can see what browser they're using whenever they open this. I can come in and filter it. Let me click on my type. We'll go into opens. And let's say maybe I want to see all of my clicks. I can um, filter it by there. Now I can see all my clicks. So I can see all of these individual clicks for these people. I could also come in and filter it. Maybe I want to separate it out and just see my bounces. So maybe I want to see my hard and soft bounces. I can select those and now I can see my hard and soft bounces. I could look into my hard bounces and see if it was you know, something to do with maybe their email address was not typed in properly or um, it was no longer a valid address. Anything like that could um, show up here. And we also give you a description so you can see what this looks like. I can take it um, one step further, go into my mailing links and see again those unique clicks versus those total clicks. So you can see Maybe we had you know, 61 unique clicks, but there were 72 total clicks on there. All right, and then um, something else I just want to show you while we're going in here. I know we're running a little, um, what are we doing on time? Pretty good, okay. Um, I can come in and as I'm separating out my marketing list, to sh just to show you a little bit of how you can do this and sending um, mailings that are relevant to those individuals. So let me just click into, I'm gonna go into advanced find here and I'm going to be looking at our marketing list. You can create saved views very easily, and maybe I want to say I want my marketing list um, you know, that have been used in the last six months. I could go in and have my advanced time for there. Um, if I go into, maybe let's get into the interactions, and I can have a saved view and say, okay, I want all of my um, recent email opens and clicks that have happened within the last six months, and then I could, take this one step further and say, you know, clicks on these types of links. So it would be all links that are associated to maybe, you know, product A. So you can use all these as just a saved view and be able to come in here um, quickly and then get your results and see and evaluate um, the people that are interacting with your mailings. Let me jump back out into my marketing list. So you can see all my marketing lists here. You can also add multiple marketing lists. And sorry, I should have showed you this while I was in here. Um, I, I think I still have it open right here. Um, you can have additional lists on your mailings as well. So you could have four or five different lists, pull them all into one mailing. And again, we can make our HTML dynamic and have it show different images, maybe different text, depending on um, what stage of the sales process this person is in, or maybe um, what their job title is. You can separate those out and send individual messages to them um, through dynamic content and through merge fields. Okay, and let me jump back into my view here. Okay. So, um, and as you build out your scoring model, it's important to keep in mind that there are two really important types of data that um, it is being your scores are being based against. So, what you want to do is come in and develop a strategy for your campaign ROI. So, definitely you want to determine your ownership. So, who's going to run the reports? When are they going to be run? And how are they going to be distributed? Um, you want to determine who's going to interpret those reports and share key findings and make sure that each team is crystal clear on whose responsibility that is. Again, you can see there's a lot of information in there. You want to make sure that you're using it wisely and make sure you're talking um, directly to those individuals how they've asked to be um, spoken to. So, you know, again, with those subscriptions, um, with those preferences, you want to make sure and honor those. You want to develop um, a standard procedure. So um, 
adopt a standard process to evaluate each report, interpret the data, and make recommendations both within the marketing team and to other departments. You guys have to work together. There has to be um, unity across those um, departments. Um, your procedures will probably vary between, you know, like direct mail, emails, trade shows, uh, other types of campaigns, but it's important to make sure that each of the same type of campaign, you're tracking the same metrics over time. So that way you can benchmark an individual campaign against previous results. And it's critical to, to, excuse me, to determine future campaigns that your team will engage and invest time, money, and resources in. It's also important to regularly report and assess the performance of individual components of your marketing mix. So you can go in and look for patterns. Um, and then you can act on those patterns. So review your trend information um, like list growth or collateral, um, different offers that they're consuming and see if there's valuable, actionable insight there. And then you also want to ask, uh, offer a dashboard view for, again, maybe your C-level. So consider implementing maybe a web-based or self-service dashboard where they can come in and look and get the information quick and see what they want. So within 2011 and now 2013, you can have your dashboard so they can kind of get a quick screenshot of that and see how everything is interacting and where, where your hot leads are. You can um, leverage lead scoring as well, but you can just get a quick snapshot into how everything is performing and the ROI on all of those campaigns. All right, so Dan, if you want to kind of wrap this up here and um, let's cover the ingredients for that marketing success and kind of just pull it all together here. And um, I'm, do we have any questions coming in? I think do we, we do have a few, Tara, so okay. I will, uh, I, I'll will just summarize here. Um, I'll answer the first question that I saw and then we'll open it up for additional questions. So, Tara, thank you. Um, I think it's really important that everyone remember this, that there, it's important to, to cover a strategy for campaign ROI. That ROI is going to live at the individual campaign level, the individual list level, but not to be forgotten, as with every CRM deployment, from a user adoption perspective, an engagement standpoint, is an executive involvement or management involvement. So as Tara pushed through the dashboard view, again, reminding you that these dashboards will be created directly in CRM. Microsoft Dynamics CRM offers a very robust kind of dashboarding mechanism. Everyone's in Outlook, or the majority of us live in Outlook every day. Microsoft Dynamics CRM lives in Outlook. You can then leverage those dashboards. and. If you find something that happens to fall outside of the dashboarding capability, which isn't very often, or because an executive wants it in a different format than the dashboards can offer, you can always punch out into an SSRS report, which is basic CRM uh, capability as well, comes with CRM just by virtue of the way that CRM is built. So it's important to think about individual list or source strategy what, when I evaluate those pieces total campaign strategy and evaluation, and then the people side of the equation. Um, couldn't be happier to hear Tara continually talk about the engagement with other groups as well. That's really important. So as we look at the, the vision, the data, and the skills one more time, it's important to plan and to develop your strategy, whether it is on an annual level for the shows that you're going to attend, or your just general marketing uh, steps that you're going to take this year, to individual campaigns, through to making sure your data is clean and trusted, and you're always working on an evaluation strategy and executing on that plan to keep your data clean and fresh to help you as the marketer and all of those subsequent users that leverage the data, teaming with the rest of your organization oftentimes more than just the IT organization is critical to that piece. And of course, putting the skills in the right hand. So one of the things I sh I've always shared with my marketing automation and CRM customers is that more people on the business side would like to have the skills to do their job. What folks don't like to do is rely on a technology department to be their operational support. Core motives, by virtue of living in CRM, gives you those skills that a marketer right in front of you. You don't have to ask 
IT to go build a complex list for you. You're able to build it in CRM. You don't have to ask your reporting group or IT again to go build a report off data that you can't see. It lives in CRM. Core Motives data is integrated and lives in CRM. So you have the skills and you have the capability to do things real time and not put in a service request, if you will. So it's important that these trailing two pieces, data and skills, be thought about on a routine basis. Um, with that, I'll, I'm going to move to the first question, then we can open it up for additional questions. The, the first question that, that I came across was provide an example of a win back campaign. So I'm going to make an assumption that um, everyone on the call has been to an entertainment park. So you could take like a Disney World or a Sea World or uh, even a regional park or something close or local to you. And let's say for this example that um, I'll use myself as an example. Let's say that the Dan Griffin family buys an annual pass for Disney in 2012. And the calendar year comes, or my annual pass comes up and it expires. With marketing automation, I can determine that Dan has not re-upped his pass. So it's not just the campaign prior to me having a renewal date, but now it's a win-back campaign around, hey, the Griffin family didn't renew, let's find out why and market to them in a different way because it could be a myriad of reasons. Maybe I don't live in the area. Maybe there's a different park within this family of, of entertainment parks that I could be marketed to. So an example of a win-back campaign is when you're comparing information that happens now to something that was more positive in, in the past. Um, so hopefully that helps as an example uh, of a win-back campaign. And you can then take that data within this win-back campaign and you can market to the Dan Griffin family very differently than someone who's never been an annual pass holder like, you know, at this particular entertainment park, for example. So with that, um, Jason, we'd go ahead, like to go ahead and open it up for, uh, for questions if there are any. Okay, great. And uh, as we said, you can uh, ask your questions either through the chat or the Q&A block, and we'll uh, take as many as we have time for here. Uh, Dan, one question that came in. What responsibilities does the sales organiza organization need to take on in CRM with regard to marketing campaign ROI? Sure. So it's a great question. The uh, most important piece is kind of marrying the sales and marketing organizations together. I've been involved in numerous Salesforce automation deployments from a CRM perspective where marketing becomes an afterthought. And I'm sure the marketers on this call have all heard the uh, I get paid to sell, not put data in uh, salesperson discussion. So we really have to create a compelling incident or the what's in it for me. Uh, the, the basic answer is sales plays a critical role in data cleanliness and also providing information. So maybe in a particular sales environment, the sales team is really that first line fielding a call from any kind of marketing effort. It's their responsibility to help track that source. Not everything is electronic in nature. So developing a what's in it for me or that compelling scenario for the sales team, which is often um, can be a challenge to, to want to be a part of a campaign like this. You need to prove or, or work to show how it's a team, but you really need to empower the sales team to show that if you do X, you're going to get Y in return. Now, it might not be immediately, but showing the life cycle of the relationship can help. And that's going to, um, you know, to, to the person asking the question, it's really going to depend on what your business model is like. We always encourage our sales and marketing departments and CRM deployments, both enterprise-wide and small-medium business, to take the time out and think about that vision that both are trying to accomplish, knowing that each has a separate role within that vision, but always reevaluating what you're doing to make sure that you're helping each other because sales and marketing are eternally coupled together in driving business. All right, great. And I, I, I would actually ask as, as a follow-up to that, do you have any guidance on um, maybe the the profile of a marketing team that would be sort of managing uh, marketing automation capabilities 
uh, like the ones you've been discussing today, you know, or maybe a couple of different profiles for a smaller versus a larger organization or their other recommendations that, that you typically make. Sure. Tara, do you mind uh, maybe talking a little bit about some specifics, uh, you know, without mentioning customer names that make sense from a small, medium business, kind of the profile marketing breakdown versus, you know, the larger ones much tougher because you can have 50 or 60 folks and, and it can be highly variant based on those uh, those enterprises. But Tara, could you talk about the different the different kinds of makeups of marketing departments? Yeah, sure. So, and I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, I, you know, I have I have worked um, with the a large variety of um, marketing teams and, you know, all the way from a, kind of a one a one man or one woman show all the way up to, you know, 50 or 60 people um, all within there. I think a lot of times, and especially now that, um, you know, people are really focused on the numbers and focused on um, getting that return on investment, you want to, the marketing automation piece really helps marry this all together and helps that one person be able to do the work of maybe a five or six person marketing team. And it, they can go in and set up that automation, set up um, things on the back end, and just let them go. It's kind of a set it and forget it. Um, so, you know, there's usually always you're going to want somebody that's focused on the data portion of it, somebody that's helping with that reporting. Um, I often see a lot of marketing teams that have one person that's kind of devoted to the email section of it. And um, I usually work, you know, fairly closely with them as well on making sure they get everything set up, getting all of those nurture programs together, getting it all set to go so that they can kind of set it once and then it can manage itself. Um, with those subscriptions, that's another great thing that you can kind of set it up in the beginning and then it's going to manage it itself and Core Motors will go in and update that um, going forward and you know, with those opt-outs and the um, subscribes and all of that. Um, so always, I always kind of see it separated out um, if for, and again depending on the size, but you have some people that have focuses on others, but then on focus on one specific thing, but then it's always good to make sure that everybody is working together and speaking together. Um, then, you know, we usually have our, our um, kind of collateral type people, the people that are um, generating this content and then working in tandem with the person that is sending out these emails to get this all grouped together. I'm not sure, does that answer the question a little bit of how, how it's kind of separated out or? Uh, I, I think it does. Um, okay, yeah, certainly great. different roles to uh, to be aware of there. Uh, well, that ends the uh, the question queue here, and we are at about the top of the hour, so uh, maybe we can start wrapping up. Um, we have recorded today's session. It will be available on demand uh, quite soon. Um, Tara and Dan, I want to thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to the audience for, for joining us, for asking the, the questions, and we really appreciate having you. So uh, from us here on the panelist side, thanks, and have a great day. Great, thanks.